When you saw them kissing, it was like a geologic shift took place in your head and your heart. I think it tapped into a deep well of my own grief and sadness that I had for all kinds of reasons. I knew right away that it was something uh, special. Welcome to Script Apart, a podcast about the first draft secrets of great movies. Each episode, a brilliant screenwriter revisits their initial screenplay for what became a beloved movie, discussing what changed, what didn't, and why, from first draft to the big screen. Today's episode was an emotional one to record. Earlier this year, celebrated author and screenwriter Diana Rossana lost her longtime collaborator, Larry McMurtry, the man that she won an impressive haul of Oscars, BAFTAs and Golden Globes with. She and Larry enjoyed a creative partnership that spanned multiple decades and many acclaimed projects prior to his death in March 2021. None, however, were more important or culturally impactful than the incredible Brokeback Mountain. Their screenplay for Ang Lee's 2005 drama drastically moved the needle in terms of same-sex representation in mainstream cinema. Adapted from a short story by Annie Prue, and starring Jake Gyllenhaal opposite the late great Heath Ledger, the film was widely acclaimed for its astonishing performances and alternating moments of life-affirming passion and impossible-to-stomach heartache. As Diana explains, it was derided by some in Hollywood as the gay cowboy movie upon release. But the sheer storytelling power and emotional weight of this tale of two sheep farmers who fall for each other in a 1960s America where men are meant to be macho saw Diana and Larry get the last laugh. Today, the film is regarded as one of the defining love stories in modern movie history. I spoke to Diana about the tricky process of building out Annie's short story into a fully realised film. We discuss all the ways the screenplay evolved from its original outline, how the film was almost directed by Pedro Almodovar, and why it was so important to her and Larry that they attended to the emotions of the wives and girlfriends caught up in the debris of Ennis and Jack's infatuation for each other. Diana was also kind enough to share a number of incredibly touching stories about her close connection to Heath Ledger, who reminded her of her own son, who had tragically passed away. As I say, this was an emotional one to record, and I'm so grateful for Diana for such a moving and open conversation about a movie that remains so dearly beloved 15 years after its release. A quick reminder before we dive into the episode that if you like what we do on Script Apart, there are a couple of ways you can show your support. For starters, you can rate and review us on Apple Podcasts, which helps other movie lovers and emerging writers discover the show. You can also join us on Patreon, where for the price of a single monthly cup of coffee, you get a whole ton of perks, including access to the first issue of our brand new digital magazine. Head to patreon.com forward slash script apart if you'd like to get involved there. Okay, that's the promotional stuff out the way. Let's get into my conversation with the amazing Diana Rosanna. A huge thank you as ever to our Patreon supporters, that includes Joe Chadwick and Matthew Brady. You're listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Diana, thanks so much for joining us on Script Apart. How are you doing today? I'm okay, and thanks for having me. I've been so excited to talk about this film with you. Brokeback Mountain is a movie with such an important legacy. Culturally, I'd argue that we're we're still seeing the ripples from it 15 years on. A lot of the representation we see on screen today and the diversity of love stories that are allowed to be told in 2021 are down, at least in part, to this movie. I wanted to start by asking, though, personally, how big a place Brokeback has in your heart. Do you find yourself thinking about this story and these characters often? Yes, I do. I mean, um, when I first read the short story, it had such a profound effect on me. Uh, I don't think I don't think I've ever read anything as affecting so immediately and so long lasting as that short story. Um, I knew when I read it that it was powerful. It had uh, um, the character development the way that Annie described the characters, the landscape, uh, the progression of the story itself, all of it. I knew right away that it was something uh, special. Obviously, the story is beautifully written and the, the, the tragedy of repression that runs through it is heartbreaking. Was, was there anything else, though, like on a thematic level that the movie spoke to in terms of love, connection, the things we deny ourselves, the joys we permit ourselves? What was it about the grand message of the story that really made you so determined to adapt it? 
I think it tapped into a deep well of my own grief and sadness that I had um, for all kinds of reasons. And it was the story itself was given to me by a friend of mine who is gay, and he had not yet come out to his family. Um, he'd given it to me that day, and he didn't tell me what it was about. He just said, there, here, there's a story in here you should read. He gave me The New Yorker. And so when I read it, I think the best word to describe uh, what it brought out in me was compassion. Uh, compassion for people's lives uh, that were so so defined by the choices they made and whether or not they would uh, would succeed or not emotionally in their lives. Um, it was, uh, thinking about it intellectually, it was definitely a, a story about rural homophobia. And homophobia essentially means fear of homosexuality. And the fact that the characters, um, Ennis so much more so than Jack, Jack was much more open. Ennis's fear of his own homosexuality. Um, I just felt that it would have, it was such a powerful story. And I felt I wanted to get it out into the world in some major way, right away. I knew that. And so when I went to sleep and I woke up the next morning, it was at night, I couldn't sleep. Um, I have insomnia historically. And after I read it, I was so overwhelmed emotionally and exhausted. I fell right to sleep. I woke up the next morning, I read it again, all the way through. And it affected me just as much as it did the night before. So I knew that it wasn't just one of those late night, everything is, is amplified kind of things. Um, you know how when you read something or you see a film and you and it's great and you think, God, I, I want my friends and family to see this. It's so amazing. And, you know, you want others to, to, to experience it the way you did. Um, I knew that the, the best way to get it out into the world would be fil a film. And so that morning I went downstairs. Uh, uh, we were in Larry's big house over in Texas. And I asked him to read this story. I said, you have to read this story. He said, a short story? I, he, he said, no, I don't read short fiction. And I said, what? He said, I don't read it because I can't write it. So I had him read it. Uh, 20 minutes later, he came back downstairs, went up and read it. And he was quiet, which was for Larry was unusual. <laughs> <laughs> He's always got an opinion and something to say. And I said, well, what did you think? And he said it was the best short story he'd ever read in the New Yorker, aside from Flannery O'Connor. And I said, would you consider writing a screenplay with me? And this is a man who, talk about contrary and stubborn. It's the first time and the last time in our, in our total friendship that he agreed to something immediately. I was kind of shocked. He just said, <laughs> he went, sure. Like, okay. And we wrote Annie a fan letter, a little single eight page fan letter right away and asked her if we could option it. She wrote us back a week later and said, I don't see a film here, but have at it. Have your people call my people and we'll launch into this. So, you know, and, and as time went on, uh, Al, it, 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 it um, the importance of that story uh, came to me gradually, really. I was, was, it was not about giving a message or sending a message. It was about telling an affecting story uh, with convincing characters uh, who people could un maybe come to understand or feel compassion for or sympathy or, or some understanding really about people's lives other than their own. Mm. So and there wasn't any really a message, you know. But was there um, an understanding at all as you worked on the film, as you worked on the screenplay, of the societal change that perhaps it could help inspire and, and the grave urgency with which that change needed to happen? I mean, I mean, I read that soon after completing the screenplay, the body of Matthew Shepard, who was a student at the University of Wyoming, who identified as gay and was murdered because of it, he was found five minutes from your daughter's apartment in Wyoming. Yes. I, I mean, what can you tell me about the, the prevalence of homophobia at the time and the importance of stories like this that challenged that kind of prejudice? Well, that happened about a year after we finished the script. And 
again, I mean, that story, because of its power, I just felt like it would bring s- some people to an understanding of what it feels like to be in that situation and unable to, to follow your feelings, how constrained and repressed you are, you know, to have some sympathy for that. Um, I think I came to know as time passed how important it could be, but I never dreamed in a million years it would have the impact that it had. I just knew it was powerful and meaningful and important. Um, The Matthew Shepard incident, my daughter, I went straight to Wyoming after it happened because there was this uh, atmosphere of of, um, fear afterwards. Uh, the press descended on the town. Uh, they were trying to, the authorities were wanting to question, um, you know, just about everybody in the school. They can't, My daughter was on the basketball team. There were gay women on that team. Um, not obviously gay, you know, not, not uh, openly, but uh, they wanted to talk to these, these uh, young women about their lives and what they had experienced, and they wouldn't talk about it. They were all afraid, mm. you know, and it, I came to understand, too, that it, it was a little bit scary uh, to me in terms of what our story was about, too. Because, you know, after the um, after the film came out, we did get uh, some hate mail. You know, some anonymous, some not. But the majority of the mail that we got tr- truly was. um it was about people who, I mean, gay people, straight people, parents, husbands, wives. Uh, this is this was my life. I can't believe I saw it on screen. This was our son's life. This is what happened to him. We, you know, we're thank you so much for bringing an awareness to this. Um, and that really and truly, I think, was the most gratifying thing. The fact that see, people actually went to see the film, of course, we were grateful for that. But the fact that it affected people on an individual basis, just, you know, it felt, um, it felt very important. Mm. Yeah, that must, must have felt so rewarding. Um, t- Diana, t- to wind back to something you said a few moments ago, you mentioned that Annie invited your people to contact her people. <laughs> and yeah, to, to go about that process of optioning the book. I'm, I'm curious to know if there were any assurances that you had to give her. I mean, there'd been an adaptation of um, The Shipping News a few years earlier, and I'm sure she must have, she had seen the capacity for Hollywood to adapt her work with oh, a certain boy. recklessness from the original story. <laughs> um, and Brokeback Mountain was such an easy story to, to tell wrong. You can easily imagine a version of this film that misses its message that changes its ending to give the characters a happy ending or that shies away from from the sexual passion of these characters to make it as palatable as possible. How did you and Larry convince Annie that, hey, we're on the same page, we're not going to mess it up? Well, I think, first of all, because it was Larry and um, the fact that he had written so convincingly of of the Western culture, uh, because this was a contemporary Western. I think she trusted that because of Larry, but we also uh, made it clear that we we would uh, share our screenplay with Annie, which is not a common thing to do when you option material, because often the writer just um, the writer becomes so connected and attached to the characters in the story that they can't see any changes being, you know, of benefit. Um, I think that Annie trusted us immediately, like I said, because of Larry, but also because we told her we'd let her read the script. And we did. She had some concerns initially, and they were, but they were minor things. Uh, I can give you an example. I got on the phone with her and spent a couple of hours going through the script, you know, the, the first draft. And one of the things she said towards the end, um, you know, when Ennis's daughter comes to see him and she's getting married, and he pulls a, a bottle, like a, in the script, it was a, a half a bottle of white wine was in the refrigerator. And, she's, and he pulls it out and pours them a glass of wine, each of them. And she said, oh, old whiskey drinking Ennis wouldn't have wine. And I said, oh, well, that bottle of wine was uh, the legacy of, of Cassie. 
his, his ex-girlfriend. <laughs> and she said, oh, I love that. Oh, that's great. <laughs> so that's the kind of thing. And, uh, you know, just a few, uh, some verbiage here and there that she, just tiny things, wording she wanted to change, maybe mm-hmm. three or four spots. But that was pretty much all, all that she said in terms of criticism or suggestions. So how did you and Larry work out how to expand the story for screen? Annie had said, I don't think there's a movie in it. But you guys, you guys identified spaces in Annie's story that left room for more. And yeah, I'm curious to know like how you went about identifying those changes and additions you could make while still staying true to these characters and, and Annie's story. Sure. Well, first of all, I'll say this. Uh, an opportunity in a story like this, I think, comes along once in a lifetime. That story is very is so specifically near perfect in, in its telling. Um, and we were lucky. I th- we felt very fortunate that Annie let us option it. We optioned it with our own money, $10,000. Um, when I was reading the story, uh, the things that were, were stimulating my imagination were I'm wondering how the wives are actually feeling about this and reacting because these things don't happen in a vacuum. And they didn't in that story either. How is it affecting the wives? How is it affecting the rest of the family? What are their kinds of responses? Um, because that feeds into Ennis' own homophobia. Um, so when we set out to write the script, we sat down and Larry and I, um, at, when we first started screenwriting together, it was 1993. Uh, and so this was about five years into our collaboration. And um, we would sit down, one of us would start, you know, writing the, the beginning and we'd finish our pages and then hand them to the other. They would read them and they would continue on with the story. And now the way that Larry writes or did write, um, he only wrote five pages a day, no more, no less. And he would stop in the middle of a sentence if he had to. When, I was writing a, when he's writing a script, it was the same. He'd stop in the middle of a, of a dialogue exchange if he had to, or end a narrative, and then that would be it. It was the five pages, and it was, like I said, no more, no less. Uh, me, on the other hand, I just s- sort of launch into it and go um, as long as I, as I feel up to it as long as I feel uh, I'm doing service to the story and characters. And that could be three pages or it could be eight pages. But I, but I would take his pages and enter them into my computer because Larry typed for 50 years, 60 years on a manual typewriter. It was a little... <laughs> It was uh, a little challenging for me because it just it it required more time, you know, to take his his uh, typing and put it in my computer. But the but what was good about it was that as I was entering it, of course, I could I could read it or make changes. And he was never propi- proprietary about that. He never considered this an insult or, you know. And we always talked about everything. So what we decided to do initially was we. First, we uh, scripted the story, what was in in essence in the story. Then we went back through and we would even take just a single sentence and think this would be a great scene. This would make a good scene. Let's get a scene with um, Alma and Ennis. Uh, Let's have a scene where uh, Lorraine and Jack are arguing. You know, we, we just went through it just that way, just exactly the way the story was told chronologically. And we'd add things and and expand. I think, um, you know, the scene where Jack gets the postcard that Ennis is getting divorced and he drives all the way up there to Mm. see him, thinking they're going to be together. That was just two sentences in the story. And that's a three to four page scene. But it was great to write it. It was so great to sit down and imagine what their exchange would be. What were some of the avenues you explored in that early process? where, you know, you were wondering, you, you were exploring the ideas, the, the, the things that might have happened, scenes and moments that could exist. Were there any that didn't make the movie in the end, but existed for a moment, either in an outline or just in, an, in a notepad somewhere? Yes. I mean, uh, the actual shooting script uh, was about 100 pages. There wasn't, our script w- wasn't that long. It was 110 pages when we finished it. Um, at the very beginning of the film in the screenplay, um, 
there's uh, an exchange between Ennis and the the semi truck driver, you know, in the cab. And then when he gets out of the truck, there's an exchange there. And it's not in the this the movie. But um, I mean, it, it, I guess it's superfluous, but it gives you a sense of how Ennis speaks and how and the place that he is too, according to the trucker, you know. Um, they talked a little bit about Brokeback Mountain. They said something about it in there. And then he went on. Uh, that wasn't in there. But when you read the script, it's really enjoyable. It's just kind of, you know, I have to say, um, having worked with that script for all those years, I came to know those characters and I knew the script by heart. You know, I'd been through it several times and talked to people about it and talked to a couple of directors about it and, you know, that kind of thing. And so I knew it from page one to page 110. Um, so, but losing that, that sequence was, didn't, had no effect on the film. The way the film opens, of course, is that giant shot, the landscape, and you see the lights of that truck coming down the highway, which is a great shot. It's a great prep, you know? Well, I'm glad you brought up that little preamble because, well, it really does give me an insight into how you and Larry viewed Brokeback. Like, you're very descriptive of it as this barren mountain that stretches up above the tree line. And immediately on page one, the mountain takes on this almost mythical status. Was there an extent to which like that barrenness you describe was a metaphor for, for the loneliness that each character is experiencing? You know, when we write, we never thought about it that way. All we think about or thought about, and I'm still that way, is character in place. And we try to be as realistic as possible. And only in reflection or going back to it would we even think about metaphors or similes or whatever, you know, that kind of thing. But I guess it does. I guess it, it, it's a couple of things. You know, there's a, a line that Lorene says when Ennis calls her when he finds out Jack has died, where she says, I thought it, this was just some made up place, you know, with a whiskey spring and where the birds sing. And for Jack and Ennis, it kind of was, you know, because when they come down from that, they feel safe up there and cut off from the rest of the world. And But when they come down from the mountain, Ennis especially, he's back to reality. And there are certain things he wouldn't dream of doing or saying back down on the flats. Maybe that was something that Ang brought to the film because... Well, one thing that's always struck me about Brokeback is the characters themselves are, especially Ennis, not very communicative. Instead, the film really seems to use the landscape to communicate how they're feeling, showing us because these characters aren't going to tell us. That's, um, was that, that's something you admired in the finished film. It was something that was necessary. Um, Larry and I believe that landscape forms a person where they grow up. You know, Larry grew up on the on the state plains. I grew up in St. Louis, where everything was very claustrophobic and crowded with greenery. And um, so, when I came out west, it was like I could breathe. I physically felt as if I could take deep breaths. And so, when I travel back to that that landscape, I start after about three or four days. I start to feel. Like, I got to get out of here. Uh, it, it's Everything's closing in on me. I can't, you know, I got to get to the open spaces. Um, and Aang and I actually uh, wanted uh, to go second unit to Wyoming to get more shots. We filmed this up in uh, Alberta. Um, but no, we, you know, we fought to have landscape in there. Larry and I emphasized that there wasn't... Uh, for our thinking, there sh there should have been more landscape, but still, it's a beautiful film, and you know we were ultimately really happy the way it turned out. When we meet Jack and Ennis for the first time, they're in search of work at the farm and ranch employment agency. Uh, what did you need to achieve with these first few pages in terms of setting up who these characters were, the intrinsic loneliness of their cowboy lifestyles, and and also like the thing that was missing in their lives? Well, you see right away when in those scenes that Ennis is very closed off. He's not interested in this other person. 
um, he sort of goes into himself. Jack, on the other hand, is really curious about this guy. You know, he's looking at him in, a, in the in the rearview mirror as he's shaving and that kind of thing. Um, and so I think it was important to show that, that those little small movements and so forth definitely show who they are. And it's just sort of closed off and like this hunched over and just looking around, but not really looking at Jack. I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's pretty clear <laughs> right away. <laughs> yeah. And we should mention at this point that there were moments um, during development where these characters were not going to be played by by Jake and Heath. I mean, I, I think I read at various points Matt Damon and Mark Wahlberg were were explored as potential actors who could fill the roles. How different do you think this movie would have been? <laughs> oh, oh, the, 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 those are very detailed uh, stories. If you want to hear them, um, you know the the as the as the script moves through the world, you know. Within five days of our manager sending out and about, uh, Gus Van Sant showed up in Texas. He just came there. You know, he was like, I want to make this film. And Gus, Gus's ideas for the characters, uh, he asked uh, Ben Affleck and Matt Damon, you know, if they would consider being in the film. And Matt had already played the talented Mr. Ripley. And he said, no, it's, 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 I just played a gay character. I don't want to play another one. I don't know if they read the script or not. Um, and uh, someone else who was interested in it from the very beginning was Joaquin Phoenix. He yeah, was right. interested in, in the role of Jack. And Larry and I thought, wow, that would be genius casting. He's such a good actor. And he's very distinctive. You know, there's nobody quite like him. Mm -hmm. um, and we felt he certainly had the chops to do it. Um, Ennis was the role that was the difficult casting. Um, Gus couldn't get that, that, that role cast. Uh, he went to several really prominent young actors at the time, and uh, one of whom committed for several months and then backed out. It, that's what would happen every single time when he'd get an actor that that he thought he had and we were moving forward, they would just back out. And I think Gus got frustrated. Um, I, I read somewhere that Gus said, well, he moved on because our vision of the story was slightly different from his. It was more like Last Picture Show. Well, that wasn't our perspective. He never voiced that to us ever. Um, we just thought he got frustrated and moved on to do uh, a remake of Psycho shot for shot, you know, <laughs> whatever. So uh, that was that. And then I think um, Joel Schumacher was interested in it for a while. And we were puzzled by that. We thought maybe he was just interested in it because he's gay, you know, we didn't know. Um, we never really had any discussions with him directly. Um, we met with uh, Pedro Almodovar, and uh, he was very interested, although he wanted to add a considerable amount of sex to this to the story. Um, you know, a little bit more would have been fine, but it it would have it would have made it a different story. Like you said before, you know, slight changes. I mean, look, from my perspective, that that script and making that film was like walking a tightrope. It could have veered off into being overly sentimental or campy instead of, run, you know, going the straight and narrow on that road to what it really was. Um, so we were we thought hmm, that's not we're not sure that's the, the direction we should take. Um, and then Good Machine, James Seamus came on board. He, he called and wanted to be involved with the film. So he, he, uh, put a small option on it and, uh, we worked with him for a couple of years and we really could, there was nobody again, you know, we kept getting these messages that, uh, it was the best script they'd ever read people, everybody call, you know, calls and messages. And we got a little bit frustrated by this because if it was so great, why wouldn't people commit? And one day I got a phone call 
from Michael Costigan. Uh, and Michael, I think at the time was, had just quit working for Sony and had become an independent producer. And he said, you know, Diana, I have had this script sitting on my desk for three months. And there was this notion going around Hollywood, they were calling it the gay cowboy movie, right? Very reductive and not even accurate. They weren't cowboys, they were wannabe cowboys, they were sheep herders. But, um, and he said, I thought, oh, this, this must be a joke. He wasn't interested in reading it. And then his girlfriend read it and said, you have got to read this screenplay. He said, I read it and I'm, I'm devastated. I'm, I'm stunned. He said, this film has to get made. I said, well, you know, or, there's no money here. If you want to help out, great. If you don't, move along. We know it's a good script. I was just at this point, I was like, you know, either uh, stick around or jump ship. So he committed to helping. And Michael and I just kept going forward, you know, taking it to people. He took it to Edward Norton, I think. And I can't remember who all at this point. I may, I have notes about all of it. Uh, and then I saw Crutching Tiger, Hidden Dragon. And I loved Ings movies anyway, but um, that movie was so intense. It was an intimate love story told on this vast landscape. And I thought, maybe he'll understand, maybe he'll get it, you know, maybe Aang will understand this. And um, about that time, uh, Seamus's option with us lapsed. And I called him up and I said, you know, could you show this to, to Aang? I was kind of surprised he hadn't showed it to him to begin with. He said, okay, sure. So a couple of weeks later, he came back, called me back and he said, well, Aang really liked the script, but we're going to, going to do the Hulk. And I said, wow, that's, that's out of the left field. <laughs> and uh, I, I said, okay. So um, we were trying to, Larry and I and Michael, we're all trying to figure out who we could approach for Ennis, you know? And uh, my daughter said to me one, uh, one day, she goes, mom, I think you need to see some movies with Heath Ledger. I said, sure. So we had a movie marathon that weekend and we watched, you know, uh, 10 Things I Hate About You, all of these, you know, going forward up through Monsters Ball. And I was just floored. I was floored as soon as I saw 10 Things I Hate About You. Mm. I thought, what is this young man doing in this film? And then, uh, and it was something about, you know, you can meet people, it, a lot is expressed in a person's eyes. And he just seemed to have depth in those eyes. He was so young, but I thought, you know, he 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 might, he might get this. And so um, I had Larry sit down with me and watch Monsters Ball again. And we got to the point where he kills himself. Spoilers for anybody that hasn't seen the film. <laughs> uh, and Larry stood up. And he said, I can't watch any more of this. This is relentlessly grim. He said, but that young man is in us. And I said, yes, yes, yes. So now we have Larry on board. And uh, I mentioned to this later, Michael and I talked about it and I had him think about it. He said, I think that's a great idea. And as it turned out, uh, Heath had played, uh, he was, had been in a soap opera in Australia and as a teenager played a young gay fellow. So I thought he won't be, you know, this, he won't be averse to this. He won't be afraid of this. So um, the Hulk came and went. And I said to Michael again, one day we were talking and I said, what do you think about sending the script back to Aang? You know, because it just seemed like that wasn't, the Hulk wasn't really the kind of film that he would do. And uh, he said, well, they're forming a, a a studio focus features and Seamus is the head. So why don't we just send it back and see if they'll, you know, I said, sure. The, I, my philosophy is always, you know, ask any, the, anybody, the worst they can say is no, they're not going to come and kill you. You know, I mean, it's just <laughs> no is the answer you would get the worst thing. So we sent it back and within two weeks we were making a deal. Wow. For the film. <laughs> <laughs> Just like that. 
almost eight years <laughs> yeah, it's later. Just like that. Um, yeah, eight years later. It doesn't surprise me at all to to hear that Ennis was was the hard nut to crack in terms of casting because so much is demanded from an actor taking on that role. It's it's a character who's not communicative. In fact, there's that lovely exchange um, early in the film. Ennis tells Jack a bit about his family, his father. Friend, that's more words than you've spoken the past two weeks, Jack tells Ennis. Hell, that's the most I've spoken in a year, Ennis replies. There's, there's so much right. power in this movie in the things that go unsaid. Like the characters never once tell each other they love each other, for instance. There you go. Exactly. Nobody noticed that, you know, I said, and the, and I said that too, when, when uh, um, we were talking about the, how Aang felt about some things and wanted some changes. Um, I said, you notice that the only time the word love is mentioned is at the very end when Ennis asks his daughter, does he love you? And what does that say? Where has he you know, how, how far has he come here? You know, baby steps, but it's like he's realizing things. So, yeah. And I mean, he, you know, uh, we had another actor. They had another actor cast. That was in August of that year after Aang had committed. And uh, we weren't particularly pleased with him. Uh, we didn't think he had any force our real depth and I don't want to insult him by naming him, but um, I just kept thinking, you know, that there's some way we got to get Heath to read the script. We've got to get Heath on board. And I know this guy's going to back out. Everybody else has. And sure enough, uh, in December, I get a call from the studio and they said, he's backed out. Uh, please don't tell anyone. Uh, we don't want to think that he's refused working with Aang. And I said, why would anybody think that? I don't think that's what, what anybody would think. <laughs> um, and, and so we hung up and I immediately called um, his agent and said, get the script to him. Because he'd already read it. I'd mm. already sent it over there. And so they got it to Heath and he read it on the way back to Australia over the Christmas holiday. It was with Naomi Watts at the time. And when I got on set, I was on set for the entire shoot because I was a producer. That was something that was a haggle, I'll tell you, to get that done. <laughs> but um, first day, Heath came up to me and he said, Diane, this is the most beautiful script I've ever read in my life. I would have gotten in a boat and rowed halfway around the world to meet with Ang to be in this film. And I thought, oh, my God, see that? And you, when you've got someone that kind of passion, how can it not be great? How can it not succeed? And so from the moment the cameras rolled, he was that character. When Aang would yell cut, he would become Heath again. I mean, he was very different from the character he was playing. He was very loquacious and young and energetic. Um, but boy, when the camera was rolling, he would just, he took it and pulled it in and became this this person, other person. Mm. I knew it would be good. I mean, we all knew it would be good actually as it, as it went on, but we, again, we never in a million years dreamed it would do what it did. We just thought it would be some small independent film that, you know, people would come and see and talk about or criticize or whatever they would do. Mm. But yeah, I mean, we were talking about lucky to have him. And that's another thing. He's an actor who comes along just about once in a lifetime. If you're working in film, so lucky. We were so lucky. Mm. Yeah, totally want, like a generational talent. But um, the, 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 the film kind of really kicks into gear after a night of heavy drinking when Jack makes a pass at Ennis, who at first is, is shocked and angry and the moment kind of threatens to become physical in a, in a violent way. Then Ennis is overcome with passion and the pair have sex in, in Jack's tent. And again, it's easy to imagine a version of this movie where the camera cuts here to appeal to more sexually conservative sensibilities at the time. Instead, it's quite forthright the way that a sec like a heterosexual sex scene would be. Why was that important to you? That that sort of not graphicness, but you know, the, the sort of honesty about gay sex in terms of how it was depicted visually. Well, when we had originally written the, that part of the script, we weren't certain how to do it. So the the first draft 
um, we've written that scene where uh, we hear them rather than see them. We hear their we hear their voices. We hear the noise of sex, you know, which sometimes can be more effective than watching it. Do you know what I mean? Mm. So we had that we had the scene written that way, where you hear the grunts, the moans, and uh, when when uh, Ennis says guns going off, you know, because that's what's in the in the story, and we have him say that, you know, when he's having his orgasm, and um, as time went on, you know, we thought to hell with that. We're just going to write the scene and make them. You know, they're going to have sex. And we want what it's seen. It's it's not rape. It's not something that's um, you know abhorrent. At least to us, it would be very realistic. And we thought it would be much more effective in terms of the, of their uh, characters, and also because they have so little time making love in the story, you know. And the fact that the next scene with them together is very tender. We just felt that segue into that would be just terrific, you know, mm. and so realistic. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, look, you know, when you think about it, I've never, ha- frankly, never had a one night stand. But um, a lot of times when people start out sexually, it's very, very aggressive. And, you know, the first sex, it's all about the sex and it come, becomes something else. Um, so to us, that, that felt realistic. And from this point, their lives go these separate ways and the movie falls into a pretty unusual structure. It's almost told in like a series of vignettes kind of flitting through time. And well, yeah, I guess let's first talk about the man that Ennis becomes. You mentioned segues there. This film is so cleverly edited. Like we, I love the cut. We go from watching Ennis retching and crying at having to part ways from Jack to him at the altar marrying Alma. And it's such an abrupt cut. I was wondering how you would describe the journey that Ennis goes on. And and as you were writing the film with Larry, how much you guys discussed the extent to which Ennis's marriage to Alma was a performance of masculinity that he's putting on, that he's trying to perform, or, you know, whether in his eye, whether in your eyes, he really did love her. Larry was very interested in the women and their, you know, their reactions and responses. Um, we both agreed that Ennis loved Alma, but he wasn't in love with Alma. I mean, we thought that was pretty clear as as um, as the story went on, because when he, you know, they had that scene at Thanksgiving that's so intense, uh, and he continued to have Thanksgiving with him, her and her new husband and everything. But um, Ennis is so repressed. You know, that scene that you speak to where he goes into the gangway and he wretches and punches the wall and all that, you know, he's doing that. He doesn't even know why he's doing that. He's 19. He doesn't understand all these feelings he's having. They're so intense because Jack is his grand passion. Um, And so when he comes out of that and he's marrying her, I think I wrote that marriage scene right there on set and came to me and said, you know, how do we going to, how would we do this? And then I had to, he wanted the actual verbiage when they get divorced to in court. So I wrote that out and we set it up. Um, but, you know, he was doing what he felt was expected of him. This is what society expected of him. Um, this is what he himself expected and he just, you know, it was all uh, sort of kind of a uh, kind of sublimation that c- came out in this anger. Uh, again, he was not a man who was self-aware. He hadn't been around the world. Somebody said to me, um, uh, I had this said to me twice later on talking about the film. Well, I didn't really understand it. Why didn't they just go to San- move to San Francisco? <laughs> and I said, where, where in the world, watching that film, would you get a sense that Ennis would move to San Francisco? It was just some, he was a rural hick. You know, he was just a, this ranch hand with not a lot of ambition. And I don't think that would have ever entered his mind. You know, again, this is his place. This is his landscape. 
Mm. You know, and as if that would solve everything, right? Although Jack does say in the story, you know, why don't we just move to Denver? And uh, it's like something Ennis can't, you know, and Denver, where the hell is that? You know, um, I just felt that Ennis was, uh, he was very angry. He was a very sad man because of the way that he had to, he had to sublimate everything. And he couldn't take a job for any length of time because he was trying to fit in his trips with Jack. So you could just see him, you know, once a year. I just, I don't know. I, we didn't, again, we didn't think about, we knew those characters. Uh, we knew them inside out, backwards, forwards. Um, and when we write, and Larry and I felt, again, this we feel the same way about this, or he did too. When we're writing, we become every character. We're every character, the good ones, the bad ones, and we have to know them inside and out. And I felt such a deep uh, sympathy for him, you know, all through the, the writing. And I really liked Jack. He was very likable, but it wasn't the same kind of feeling that I had for Ennis. For Ennis, it's hard to entertain the idea of moving, but because for him... There's nowhere he can move to where he'd be able to outrun that expectation that he feels because it's rooted in, well, it's rooted in that moment that we see in the film that I think you, I think you and Larry wrote in, I don't remember, I don't remember it being in the short story where Ennis's dad takes him aged nine to see the body of a gay man who's been murdered. It, it is in the story, but it's only oh, told. It? That's it's right. It's told, but it's not, but we don't see it. And we felt it was important as a flashback to have that because it's such a profound experience right. and the imprint it would make on a nine-year-old boy. You know, it, it, it's, it's the saying it's trite, but it's true. Uh, wherever you go, you take yourself with you. How would moving it, right. How would moving anywhere make a difference for him? And in terms of what happens to Jack in this story, there's a really interesting moment later on in the film where Jack has met Loreen, um, they've got married, and um, he's sort of become this, this family man. He's working for Loreen's father's company. They befriend another couple called Randall and LaShawn. And in a moment alone, Randall quietly invites Jack to come visit a cabin. Uh, uh, I can't remember where it is. R visit a remote cabin with him, a suggestion that's tinged with sexual possibility. Sure. Uh, this This felt to me like you wanted to establish that it's not... Jack is not a gay man looking for a relationship. He is a man who wants a relationship with Ennis, the man he can't have. You know, it, it seems like this is a suggestion that there are others living in Texas who have to live these similarly re repressed secret lives like Jack, and that he could be in a relationship with Randall or someone else like him. But it's Ennis he ultimately wants. W was that the function of that moment or was there something else you wanted to explore? Um, it's mentioned in the story, uh, and it's only mentioned by the father when Ennis goes to see the mother and the father. He was going to, yeah, you know, uh, talked about you, and then he was going to bring some other fella up here. And that's the first we hear of it. And mm -hmm. that's the first Ennis hears of it. So we created this whole sequence, you know, where Jack, and here's the big difference in their characters. Jake um, came to me one day and he said, why would Jack have these affairs if he was so in love with Ennis? Why would he be with other people, other men? And I said, honey, listen to me. Now, just listen to me. <laughs> you are, you're a completely different person from Ennis. You are open to the prospect of, of, happiness and a relationship um but you also need sex you're much more um uh needy that way Ennis doesn't need the sex you do and i don't think that jack could have sustained his love for ennis without these intermittent affairs he would have had to cut it off completely and move on because those satisfied his sexual need but it was his heart that wanted ennis 
Ennis, I said, Ennis is a one man fella and you're it. And he was like, oh, and, you know, and then it sort of just made total sense to him. You've got to do this because that was the only way Jack could continue to see Ennis. Mm-hmm. It would well, have hurt it, too much otherwise. Yeah. Well, it all comes to the fore when there's that incredibly painful scene. Ennis tells Jack that he can't take any more time off work to meet with him. And they explode into this argument, which is an eruption of things that have been building throughout the entire film. Um, Ennis begins to cry. Jack embraces him. As I say, it's a painful scene to watch. I'm wondering whether it was painful to write. And, and I'd love to hear some of your thoughts about what's happening in that moment as, as, the, over, as the emotions like overwhelm them finally. You know, after the script was finished, every time I read it, I cried. Really? Every time. Um, that was a very difficult scene to write. It was more difficult to watch it being filmed. And it took an entire day. Um, and the, the dialogue that Ennis speaks to Jack is because of you, I'm like this. That's a, there's a subtext to that. It's because of you that I'm gay, you know, that I can't love anybody else. But what he's trying to say is, you know, I have no life because of you. I, I, I don't have a steady job because of you. I got to take off, you know, I, I, I am alone because of you. I can't be with anybody else. I couldn't be with Alma or another guy. You're it. You know, he's all this, this frustration comes out of him and Heath was, they were so good. Those boys were exhausted after that. You can imagine. Mm -hmm. And about halfway through the day, um, because Ang kept making them do it over and over and over again. And at one point he came up to me and he says, is this a marathon? He was, you could see he was getting angry, but it fed right into the scene in the character. You know, it would, and also the fact that it's the last time they're together. Yeah, of course, because, well, moments later, Ennis talks to Loreen on the phone and there's so much subtlety and nuance to that moment. Loreen gradually understands who she's speaking with and she herself in this movie about repression, about repression, herself tells a lie because she can't speak the truth. Um, can you, can you tell me about what this scene meant to you and crucially why you decided to deal with Jack's death this way in these kind of snatches of his real life fate that, that <sighs> flicker violently on screen during their conversation? Um, Larry and I went back and forth when we were writing that whole sequence, talking to each other and we would switch positions. He said, he would say, you know, accidents like that happen all the time. Tire rims slamming people in the face, trying to change tires or, or, and then I would say, yeah, but you know, also I said, look at Matthew Shepard. I said, and especially someplace like Texas where macho is everything. And then we'd switch, you know, he would say, well, he was beaten to death. And I'd say, maybe it was the time, you know, we'd go back and forth, which is essentially what we wanted the audience to do. The audience, you know, whoever watches that brings, sees it through the lens of their own experiences and knowledge. And so whatever, whatever way they take it is, is very personal. Um, the scene where Ennis calls Lorene, uh, Ennis, uh, Ennis, listen to me. Keith came up to me and he said, uh, you know, what, what do you think about this? And I said, well, you need to be very subtle. I'm, I said, these are your choices. I'm just, you know, telling you things about the character. I don't believe we see uh, Ennis really cry. We see a little bit of it when he's in the gangway after they part. But we don't see that again until he finds the shirts. Mm. And I said, so, you know, when you do this um, scene, um, I think you need to feel your way through it, through the conversation. Uh, think about it in terms of this is something that you really are having a difficult time comprehending. It's not real to you yet. 
And so all of this has to come to you in that call, you know, and, um, and the thing that you fear most uh, in your mind may have been what happened to him. Doesn't mm-hmm. mean that it happened, but it's the thing that you fear the most. We already knew that, right? So that's, you know, and he did it several times and, you know, he'd finish a take and he'd look at me and I would go like this, or I'd say <laughs> like this, you know, down, play it down a little or whatever. Um, but look, he got it. Look at how that young man understood that character and how deeply committed he was to that. That's not to say Jake wasn't either. Jake was very committed. Um, and so were the young women. You know, um, I suggested Michelle for that role. In fact, Larry and I, you know, we would get lists of actors that were of the age appropriate, you know, from yeah. the casting person and um, long lists. And I was the only one that picked Michelle when we sent our lists around to everybody. You know, she was one of about five young women. But because I'd seen her in Dawson's Creek, you know, again, it was like, what is this girl doing in this series? She's just so there's so much to her. She's like still waters, you know, that run deep. And um, she came to me and asked me why her character would stay with Ennis after she sees the kiss. And I said, well, imagine yourself growing up in a trailer house with your folks. And you leave home, they live in a trailer, and you get married. Your whole, your, your worldview is very narrow. When you saw them kissing, it was such a shock to you. It was like a geologic shift took place in your head and your heart. But you weren't really sure what you were seeing. You may not even have been aware of, of homosexuals at your young age and with your, you know, small world experience. And you may have thought, what just, what did I just see? What happened? I know it's something intense, but I need to figure it out. So I said, you might've gone to the library. You might've talked to your mother. You might've figured this out and and you found out. But the fact is your entire um, uh, uh, sort of view of your future was to get married and have children. Now you can't go back to your parents because they live in a trailer house. You've got these, these children. There's no way you, they can afford that. Um, you can't afford to leave him. So now you're thinking about what are your options. And so when you meet Monroe, it's like, this is my way out. Mm. So she went, oh, you know, we, I, we just gave her a backstory. I just gave her this backstory. And so then she understood, you know, then she could consider why she's staying with him. Yeah, there's it, it's. It's so admirable how much compassion is dealt to those characters who otherwise might have been afterthoughts in the hands of other writers. But we should talk about the ending, Diana. It's oh one boy. of the most beautiful, <laughs> devastating final lines in cinema. And I spent a while before our conversation trying to work out what it is about it that just decimates me. I think I think what it is, is the fact that it's an unfinished line, Jack, I swear, even in this final moment of emotion, Jack still can't force the words out. He can't complete the sentence aloud. It's a movie that deals about deals in repression so heavily. And even still in that final moment, it feels like a triumph. But at the same time, it's still tinged with such tragedy. Can you tell me what that final moment meant to you and how you and Larry ended up there? I get really emotional when I talk about this, so bear with me. Uh, I have to speak to the scene with the shirts first. When Ennis goes to see his parents, you know, because Jack wanted his ashes scattered on Brokeback Mountain, right? He goes to see the parents and uh, it's there that um, Ennis discovers how deeply he was loved and what he's lost, right? When he finds those shirts, uh, his shirt is inside Jack's when he finds them. 
And that was a hellish scene. Talk about a difficult scene. Um, Heath, uh, we were filming night, you know, for day. And so there were lights everywhere and, and we were out in the middle of nowhere. And of course it's pitch black everywhere else but the set. And uh, about halfway through the, the, this, the scene, um, shooting the scene, uh, he was upstairs in the house. He, and he came down the stairs between takes and he looked at me and uh, Michael Costigan happened to be there too. And he said, what, what, how did, how am I doing like that? And we just looked at him. I mean, we were, I was afraid to cry. He just looked at us and ran out the door. I have to get out of here. And, you know, he looked stricken. So I went after him running out to, into the, he ran out into the darkness. And I said, Heath, are you okay? He said, leave me alone. I just have to be alone for a while. I just have to be alone for a while. And he went out. I mean, it was so dark. You couldn't see 10 feet in front of you when you got away from the lights. And he reappeared about, it took about 30 minutes for him to come back. Um, so at the end of the movie, in that last scene, um, as I said, Ennis understands what he's lost. And that's why he asks his daughter, does he love you? Right? Now, he knew he loved Jack, but he didn't realize how deeply Jack loved him. So at the end, when he says, Jack, I swear, in my mind, he's saying, I swear if we had it to do over, I swear, I swear, if, if only you were still here, if only, if only, if only, you know, it's about regret. Ennis has that tiny bit of redemption with his daughter, right? And the redemption comes as small as it is when he says he changes his mind and said, yeah, they can get another hand. I'll come to your wedding. When she asks him to come and, and he says, I got it. You know, I got a job. And then he sees her, he sees her disappointment and he understands it. And then he says, no, I'll, you know, that's the one time his tiny bit of redemption. Mm. And in that moment, right at the end, Jack's, these two shirts kind of entwined in each other. They oh, hang. that's a story. That's Please a story. Me. Let yeah, me tell you quickly. Uh, the day that, that we filmed that, at morning, um, Heath came up behind me. And uh, he was so sweet. He reminded me so much of my son who's passed away. Um, had the same kind of energy, you know, uh, very light and young and kinetic. He came and he put his arms around my neck from behind. And he said, I have a surprise for you. And he came around and I said, okay, what is it? He said, well, you have to watch the scene and then figure it out. <laughs> I said, okay, okay. So, and it was just, the, it was just the scene where he says uh, goodbye to Alma. I mean, to um, Alma Jr. And then he goes to the shirts, right? And of course he goes, and I'm telling you right away, you can see it in his face. It's just there, the, you know, that, those feelings. Well, when he opens the closet, he's got Jack's shirt inside his. He has switched the shirts. That's not in the story. That's not even in the script. He did that. Heath did that. Wow. And he got all done cut and he ran out of the trailer house and runs up to me and he goes, what do you think? What do you think? He was like, <laughs> I was crying. I'm crying. I said, look, I'm crying. What do you think? I think, you know, he was so excited. It was so cute. It was just sweet as it could be. Oh, but again, gosh. that's how much he, that's how much he understood that story. Mm. Did you, I mean, it sounds like you and Heath really struck up a relationship on the film. Did you, did that, did that relationship maintain in the years that followed? Well, a little bit. Um, we had another script, Larry and I had written uh, of his novel, Anything for Billy. And we were wanting Heath to be Billy in that one. I don't know if you've read that novel. No, no. It's really funny. It's funny and then tragic. 
um, but it's a parody of a dime novel. And uh, it's about Billy the Kid, as Larry would imagine him. And uh, um, it's really about two things. It's the story of Billy the Kid, but it's also, in a deeper sense, a story about um, what does it take to write? Is, does life experience give it more meaning or does it come from the imagination, right? And uh, Larry, and I believe it just comes from some strange, obscure place that nobody else knows about, your imagination. But that's the, that's the conflict in that, in that story. And if you read the book, you'll understand what I mean. So anyway, but we, he wanted to play uh, Billy. But then he launched off and he ran off and did Casanova. And then he, um, you know, he was doing, he did that film uh, for, for Terry that was later, but he did The Dark Knight. Mm -hmm. And I think it was after he and Michelle broke up, um, he got, he found me somewhere, somehow. And he, uh, he asked me a question. Um, I've never been able to talk to Michelle about this ever, but. Um, he said, do you think there's, there's a chance that we'll ever be, you know, we'll ever be together again as a family? And I said, honey, as long as you're both alive, there's always a chance. Wow. And that's the last I talked to him. God, that's heartbreaking. Yeah. Hmm. But I mean, his his performance in this film endures, as his performances do in so many of uh, so many of his films. But I think especially this one, this and The Dark Knight, seem to sit atop the the, the top of the lists for um for for a lot of people who who love him as a performer and as a personality. Um, when we talk about the things that endure from Brokeback Mountain. What do you look at? What are the things, what are the ripples that we discussed at the beginning of this episode that you continue to see today and take pride in? Well, you know, um, after, uh, you know, when the whole gay marriage thing happened, um, and, you know, and it came into law, um, I had people contacting me the first time someone called me and said, do you see what your film has done? Do you see that how it laid the groundwork for this? I said, well, you know, I didn't really think about it, but I guess it's true. You know, um, can you excuse me a second? I have to get a Kleenex. Yeah, of course. <laughs> I have to get yeah. a Kleenex. <laughs> oh. Okay. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry. It's just I get really emotional. You can see it's still, uh, you know, when Heath passed away, I went, I had to go to bed for three days. I could barely, in fact, uh, honestly, I haven't seen the film all the way through since he passed. Really? Um, yeah. It's just too heartbreaking. You know, it's like losing a child. Um, well, and here's something that was very surprising. Um, you know, there have been these uh, websites were created after the film. One was called uh, Ultimate Brokeback Forum. And another one is, is uh, the bean cans, you know, that were in the film. The, yeah. the label, yeah. The better and beans and better, whatever it was. A website that like that called that. And these are all people that gather that have um, how, you know, and talk about how Brokeback had such a profound effect upon their lives. And of course, we got the mail. The mail was in insane. Um, but it spoke to how the story affected me. Um, I had a bunch of people contact me through Facebook that were in the Brokeback Forum, who wanted to come and visit me and Larry in Tucson. And uh, I talked to Larry a little bit about it. He was never big on things like that, but um, he said, okay. And they came to visit us and we went to dinner at a, a Mexican restaurant, big table. And uh, it was men and women. And 
what was interesting about it? You know, we wanted to hear their stories, of course, because that's why else would, would we want to see them? Every single person told us a story that was uplifting. Not sad, not, not tragic, but uh, one young man had lived in his mother's basement for 30 years. And now he was living in an apartment with his partner at deeply in love in a relationship out in the world. Those are the kind of stories we were told. We decided we couldn't waste our lives anymore. That's, that's why so the special. Jack, that's why the Jack, I swear, if you were here, the life we could have. Mm. And can you tell me what you remember about the Oscars and the the experience of that? I mean, <laughs> oh, we don't need to go into, um, needless to say, there probably oh. won't be a script apart episode on Crash anytime soon. So let's just uh, gloss over my feelings about that film. Can What can you remember about that night and sort of the enormity of it that you did or didn't feel as there was this breakthrough moment. I mean, it it is looked back upon as a milestone in terms of LGBTQ plus visibility in mainstream culture. What was what was your experience of that night like with Larry? Well, um, first of all, I have a really difficult time getting in front of people. It's just it's terrifying for me. I prefer to observe. Um, and uh, my daughter was my date. She was a great moral support, and she's a tough customer, I'll tell you. So that, that it was a huge help having her there. And she's Sarah, it was uh, Sarah was Larry's goddaughter. Uh, Larry, um, before we left, he, you know, he wore jeans and a tuxedo jacket and his boots. And he came out, and I said, he, he came out of his room, and I said, "What? What? what? Why are you wearing? You have blue jeans on?" He said, "I can't find my tuxedo pants." And I said, "That's a lie." I said, "They're right in that closet." And uh, I went and got them and brought them out. And he said, "Look," and there was a certain point. Larry and I would argue about things, it was bickering mainly. Um, and I always knew at a certain point there was no. I had to stop. He said, look, I'm not going to sit in, in what is essentially a gymnasium for four hours and be uncomfortable. I'm not wearing those pants. And I said, OK, all right. OK. So we went on and. Uh, um, it was a scary prospect, uh, you know. As a filmmaker, it, it's so difficult to start listing what's the best. Because all the films that I went through the award season with these folks, they were all really good films. Uh, Crash was uh, not one of my favorites. I thought it was fairly mediocre, and I had no problem telling Paul that. Um, well, I have to go back two weeks quickly. <laughs> sure. I went, I went to a party. I was invited to a, an Oscar nominee party at Paul Haggis's house. In the evening, I took my friend Mark with me, Mark who, Mark Poirier, who had given me the short story, right? And uh, uh, got there, and there was Clint Eastwood. He was talking, I think, to Steven Spielberg. And Paul came over to me, and I said, Paul, could I meet, could you take me to meet Clint? Because one of my favorite films is The Unforgiven. And uh, in fact, I use it to, in my teaching screenwriting in my screenwriting seminars. Um, it's one of the scripts that I use. Um, he started walking me over there and he goes, well, Diane, I have to tell you something. Uh, Clint hasn't seen your movie. And as soon as he told me that, I knew we wouldn't win Best Picture. I knew it. It was like somebody punched me in the gut. I thought if a filmmaker like Clint Eastwood hasn't seen our film, what does that say? So, um, and I told Mark that, I told my friend Mark that. I didn't tell anybody else. I just thought I don't wanna make everybody depressed or be a downer here. But that night I was not surprised when we didn't win Best Picture. I was disappointed of course, but I wasn't shocked. A lot of people were shocked, including Jack Nicholson. Mm. 
And I think he said the F word when he opened that envelope. <laughs> <laughs> and later on, he told he told us that he'd voted for Brokeback, although you don't have to tell anybody who you voted for. And I do remember, um, you know, Paul, uh, Paul and his wife were sitting. Um, here's the stage. We were sitting here and Paul was over here to the right of us. And when they when they won Best Picture, um, he stood up, they were jumping up and down, and he turned and looked at me and looked away as quickly as he could. You know, and we all had to go back to the press room, right, uh, to speak to the press. And so we're, we're um, in that hallway. They were ahead of us. And uh, Paul turned around again and saw us coming and just shoved everybody, like, hurry up, let's go, let's go. Um, because I think he knew that it was kind of a, it was a complete anomaly. I mean, it was just like, what? <laughs> but boy, did it speak volumes. Um, and, you know, it's funny to this day, I still have people talking to me saying they thought Brokeback won Best Picture. Oh, no, we didn't win Best Picture, but we were remembered more for not having won, <laughs> you know? Um and it, I think I was I was the most disappointed for our crew. All of those people that worked on that movie, um, Canadian crews are terrific. They these folks. I have worked in Canada five times, and always the crews were very committed, uh, worked very hard. Um, uh, Larry would say he, he was never on set with me up there. Uh, he hated being on movie sets, but he says, "Well, they have no sense of humor," and I said, "That's not true." <laughs> They have a sense of humor. They just don't have any irony. When they speak, they're so sincere. You know, they're not sarcastic. They're just very sincere folks. I said, and it's refreshing, frankly. But the crew had worked so hard. And during the filming, so many of them came up to me and said that they felt honored to be working on that, a, a film with that script. You know, and I felt I feel like a best picture win really speaks to everyone on the film. Mm. not just the producers it's everybody because it wouldn't be what it is without all those folks but the legacy of a film is i mean it, trophies kind of amount awards amount to something but yeah they're compared, you know they're to, you know the yeah the word i keep coming back to is ripples yeah you know and they're important to a lot of people the awards um they're apparently important important to the money people um <laughs> Uh, but like I said, um, you know, you, well, you want to win and then you don't want to win. You want to win because you're, you know, you've worked so hard, but then you don't want to win because you feel bad for everybody else. Or I do. Larry didn't. <laughs> Larry's like, give me that Oscar. I'm happy. <laughs> you know, he was just, he was such a hoot. I'll tell you, I miss him so much. Mm. Yeah. yeah, I mean, I, I was so sorry to hear about Larry's loss, Diana. I mean, I, I, but I know that everything you achieved together must soften the blow of that loss. And you must have some incredible memories and very funny stories oh, to look back on. Funny, funny, funny. The man, talk about a storyteller. He would tell the same story over and over, but he would tell it slightly different so that you were always interested, right? And he was funny. So funny. Um, Larry was my best friend for almost 35 years. And we had been working together since 1993, um, which is a long time. Mm. Um, he, he, uh, the only person I've been with longer is my daughter. You know? So, yeah, I mean... <laughs> There'll never be anybody. There was never anybody like him, and there will never be anybody like him. He was unique unto himself. Um, and I feel so fortunate to have had him in my life. You know, so fortunate. That's about the only the only consolation. I mean, it's it's just there's a big empty hole, but uh, still, I do feel lucky. Yeah, I can imagine. There was a lot of unproduced. Um, sorry, there were a lot of scripts that you that you wrote together that still haven't gone produced quite yet. Do you mm -hmm. are there one or two that you hope might still kind of uh, yeah 
we have a couple of we had written a couple of television pilots or series pilots that were pretty great. I thought we both thought one was about we wrote about 10 years ago. It was called um, Lone Star Nation. And it was hit and it was a contemporary story, but it was an alternate universe. It was as if Texas had seceded from the rest of the United States and become its own country. And what would ha have happened if that were true? And it's dark. It, it, talk about black humor. It's really dark, but really funny. So funny. And we had a whole plan for a series, you know. Um, we wrote it for Fox, and then they didn't produce it. And then Amazon read it and wanted to buy it from, the, from Fox. And as soon as somebody else showed interest, they said, oh, no, we can't sell that. Offered them a huge amount of money, and they wouldn't sell it. And then there's another, there was another um, pilot we wrote. It's called uh, For Charlie Foxtrot. And it's, uh, it's a period piece, starts in the late 60s. It's about the history of the marijuana business in America. <laughs> and it's, <laughs> and it's uh, also funny, funny, so funny and dark. I mean, and people loved it, just loved it. Um, and then there's there are a couple of features. Uh, one in particular, two that come to mind. One I had written uh, back in the, about 2008, a couple of years after Brookback. It's called uh, Into the Light. And it was based on a true story. Um, this man who... Uh, um, had been blinded at a very early age and came to be uh, uh, a downhill skier. Oh, he wow. never really, yeah, he, yeah, he, in the parallel, I mean, it's the fastest uh, in the Paralympics. I mean, it's a pretty amazing story, that one. And um, I was envisioned Tom Hanks playing that role. He'd be so good at it. Um, and then this really amazing book that Larry and I had read called The Color of Lightning. Mm. it's written by the same woman who wrote news of the world that tom hanks film that came oh, out yeah yeah and uh uh it's called the color of lightning and it's about the convergence of three cultures in the 1800s comanche and kiowa coming into the reservations the uh, um, bureau of indian affairs sending a quaker out to be in charge of the two most violent indian tribes in our country you know, the Quakers don't believe in violence, nor do they mm. carry weapons. And Britt Johnson, who is a real character, a black man who came to the panhandle and his wife and children were kidnapped by the Comanche and he got them back. That was a rarity. He yeah. really did. And their stories. I mean, it's uh, it, we we read the book. Uh, we had Ridley Scott option it, but he, he hasn't made it into a film. But it's. I have to tell you, this it is so good. It's so interesting. Such an interesting story. Oh, well, my fingers are well and truly crossed that we get to see some of them someday. Diana, this has been so well, fun, emotional, the whole the whole shebang. It's been <laughs> <laughs> it's been so wonderful to talk to you. And I can't I can't thank you enough for, for coming on the show and being so open about this incredible film and your experiences writing it, your, your experiences producing it as well. Is there a, a message that you'd like to give to the fans of this film who watch it religiously, to whom, you know, it, it holds a big part in their own lives and it overlapped with their own kind of journeys, either as, you know, people belonging to the LB LGBTQ plus community or just people who connected to it on a human level? Well, I want to thank anybody who watches the film for watching it. It was really a, uh, it was a difficult journey, but when I would do 10 times over. Um, and, you know, as you live your life, you go along living your life. Uh, you know, we think being wise when we're old is one of the benefits of being old. But wisdom is what you need when you're about 20. Um, what I have learned, though, is that don't waste a single day. Every day that goes by, no matter what your age, is a day gone forever. So 
you know, you just need to make the most of every day, whether it's reading a book, cooking a meal, petting your dog, loving your partner, but don't waste your time. Don't waste your time. That's a beautiful way to leave it. Diana, thank you so, so much. This has been such an important and fascinating conversation. Thank you so much. Thank you, Al. Thank you for being interested. Thank you. You've been listening to Script Apart, hosted by me, Al Horner, produced by Camille Demek. Thanks for tuning in. We'll see you next time.